Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Heritage Radio Network's Executive Director, Katie Mosman Wadler, and I am so excited to welcome you all to today's webinar event. We're going to be waiting just a few minutes as folks are joining us. And while we wait, please feel free to let us know in the chat where you're joining from, say hello. Thank you so much for being here. Before we introduce you to our moderators, I wanted to share a little bit about Heritage Radio Network. We are a 501c3 nonprofit media organization. We are funded with support from listeners like you and our partners. We have over 30 podcasts about all things food, drink, culture, and agriculture with a mission to improve equity, sustainability, and deliciousness. You can learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. And please subscribe to our newsletter using the box at the bottom of our homepage if you would like to stay in the loop. We'll be dropping a link to that in the chat here. So briefly, let's talk about why we're here. In 1969, the first White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health led to a major expansion of federal food programs, including what we refer to today as SNAP and WIC. Fast forward 53 years, and as the United States navigates a post-pandemic landscape, more than 34 million people, including 9 million children in this country, are food insecure. In September, the Biden-Harris administration introduced a national agenda to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity by 2030 in advance of the second ever White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. Thanks to our partners who curated this event, the Food Voice and the National Food Museum, we have an all-star panel of experts here with us today to discuss what's next. So with that, I'd like to welcome our moderators, Louisa Kasdan and Dr. Michael Jacobson. We'll have you turn on your cameras. Um, Louisa Kasdan is a journalist with extensive restaurant industry experience who now specializes in documenting people's unique food stories in writing, via live events, and of course, as host of the podcast, Let's Talk About Food on HRN. She's also the co-founder of The Food Voice, a New England-focused nonprofit that advances public engagement in the food system. Dr. Michael Jacobson was the co-founder and longtime executive director of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. He's currently creating the National Food Museum, a museum with a mission addressing a range of issues from food history, to the impact of food and farming on health and the environment. Today's webinar is the inaugural public activity of the museum. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over, Louisa and Mike, to you to introduce today's panel and our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Can everybody hear me? Um, first of all, I wanna thank Katie who is, well, minutes, but maybe days away from having a baby. And I'm very happy that the baby held off so we have this, this webinar today. Um, let us begin. We are tight on time. We have wonderful speakers and we've promised to keep everybody only an hour. So I just like to start with saying on September 28th, in many ways, the real action wasn't in Washington. It was in the recommendations that were released the day before. The administration, the Biden administration proposed a wide range of action for the government and Congress to undertake. Implementing them would make a serious dent in hunger and diet quality problems. And we are grateful that some of the key players are with us today. Our focus in this webinar is forward-looking. We want to talk about what specific proposals and initiatives have come out of the conference and how do we support them and keep the momentum going. We are grateful that we have people with us today who can really help guide us through that. Let me briefly describe who we're, who we're lucky enough to have with us. The first is Congressman Jim McGovern from my home state of Massachusetts, who's really been the beating heart of this effort to have a White House conference. We also have Marian Nessel, Professor uh, Emeritus from NYU Food Studies and the author of a new memoir called Slow Cooked. I love this book. We also have Dariush Mozafarian, the Dean of Policy at Tufts University and a leading researcher on diet related causes and diseases. Um, Dariush also represents here the Tufts Freeman School, which as many of us know is kind of a prime mover behind this conference. And we also have Kirsten Toby, who's the co 
founder of Revolution Foods. Revolution Foods in California provides meals in thousands of schools and senior centers, and she is a policy expert on childhood nutrition and also represents a kind of uh, business orientation towards all of this. I am going to turn it over to Dr. Michael Jacobson to get us started, and um, I'll chime in when I need to. Okay. Right, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Louisa. Uh, we'd like to make today's webinar more a conversation than a series of speeches. So we've asked each of the panelists to limit their opening statements to just a few minutes, four minutes or so. Um, Louisa and I will serve as the timekeepers. After that, there, um, there may, uh, I'll ask the uh, panelists a couple of questions, and then panelists might want to ask questions of one another. And then in, in the last 10 minutes, maybe, of the, the webinar, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So uh, people should use the Q&A icon at the bottoms of their screens to ask questions. If you just want to chat, the chat uh, um, column will be available throughout the webinar, but ask, ask your questions at, at the Q&A. So I see Marion Nessel just joined us, which is good. Um, and, but without any further ado, let me turn it over to Representative McGovern and his, hear his thoughts about what was important, what, what were the major recommendations, if you can nail a few down, what were any omissions from the report? Congressman? Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this. And I'm happy to be with this distinguished group of panelists. Look, I think Louisa, at, in her opening uh, remarks, made mention of the fact that the last time we had a conference like this was in 1969. Uh, that was the year we landed somebody on the moon. Um, and there was a time when we used to think big. And um, and a lot of good things came out of that conference. I mean, WIC and improvements in the, in the food stamp program and uh, you know labeling and a, a whole bunch of stuff that we all look back on now and say these were all positive developments. Um, and we haven't really had that kind of holistic discussion uh, since then. And the, the problem that, that I have found when we talk about hunger or nutrition insecurity is that we're very siloed uh, here in Washington. So if you want to talk about SNAP, that's the Agriculture Committee. If you want to talk about school meals, that's the Education and Labor Committee. You want to talk about food as medicine, well, that's the Energy and Commerce Committee or the Ways and Means Committee. But if one of the other committees kind of intrudes on somebody else's territory, everybody gets all upset. So, you know, we, we don't operate in a way where we come together as a whole and say, okay, here's the problem. What can you all put on the table? By the way, not just government, but the nonprofit sector, the private sector, I mean, the faith-based community, you know, everybody, anyone who has something to offer. And so, you know, for going back to when Obama was president during his uh, first term, I've been advocating that we do another White House conference. Um, and, um, and when President Biden became, was elected, I mean, we began this effort even before he was sworn in to say, you got to focus on this issue. And they did. And this conference that we had, I thought was, uh, you know, you know, has has the potential to be revolutionary. It brought everybody in a room, all the different sectors, uh, to have a a discussion uh, about, uh, you know, what works, what doesn't, you know, what are some models out there that we need to emulate. And you had the president of the United States saying, very clearly, that it is the policy of the United States of America to end hunger uh, and diet related diseases in this country by 2030. Uh, and they came out with this um, roadmap, the, a strategy that uh, uh, position paper. I, I'd be here for two hours, three hours, going over everything in it. All the things that the administration could do, the Congress needs to do, the private sector could do, and other other uh, sectors as well. So this is th this is an opportunity. This is the beginning of, of 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 a conversation and of an effort to get this right. And it really is up to all of us to keep the pressure on. Um, and to people who have good ideas that don't require Congress, don't wait for Congress to tell you to do something or the president to tell you to go ahead and do it. Um, and, um, and, 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 and then let us know what you're doing um, and we can, we can build on that. I just came from a, a, a conference at USDA um, I, I, and Dari Mustafari was there with me. 
entitled Nutrition Security, and it was a Nutrition Security Healthcare Summit that Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack uh, organized. Uh, Secretary Becerra from HHS will be uh, speaking to the conference a little bit later. But this is a direct result of that conference. It, it was talking about food as medicine, was the fo focus uh, of today's event, how we, can, how we can better integrate nutrition um, and food into our healthcare system. You know, the discussions are really, really good. There are lots and lots of ideas that we need to build on. But again, this conference has got all these discussions started, including a discussion on universal free meals for every student uh, in, the, in this country. We need to be wind at the back of those who want to move forward. And I believe that this conference will produce lots of positive, good things that we will look back on years to come and say, you know, it was worth it. So let me end there. Well, let me follow up and ask you, uh, if as some people expect and some people fear that the Republicans are going to take over Congress in, in the next year, is there enough bipartisan support on these critical issues that affect D's and R's to get legislation passed? Is there enough support? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I go to church every day and I light candles praying that that won't be the case. Right. Uh, but, the, but the point of the matter is we have no idea what this election is going to result in. And unfortunately, um, you know, much of what we're talking about over the years has become somewhat partisan here. And I don't quite understand why, because it used to not be. George McGovern and Bob Dole worked very well together in the 1970s to move important legislation forward to end hunger and to deal with nutrition and security. We need to get back to that. But by the way, Congress, you know, people shouldn't wait for Congress and Congress can't fix this alone. Um, and one of the things that I'm really encouraged about is the fact that a lot of our governors and our mayors are wanting to take a lead on this. Some of this stuff can be, you know, led at the local level um, as, 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 and can in turn put pressure on Congress to, uh, to act. Some of the stuff that is necessary, um, you know, could be done right through regulation. For example, USDA can issue a regulation to make it um, possible for more and more schools to qualify for community eligibility with regard to free uh, meals in schools. We can, we can expand that um, and thus making it easier for states to then say, okay, you know what, let's make this permanent. You know, we will mm -hmm. pick up some of the costs and, you know, let's, let's make it, you know, the, you know, in our state that every child has a free, has access to free breakfast and lunch, nutritious breakfast and lunch in school every day. So, yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we can't control the politics of what happens in Washington, but I'm just simply saying that it's, this is not going to be fixed by Congress alone. And that's one of the things we learned in this conference. Um, everybody has a role to play. And I, and to the extent that people are willing to move forward, you know, we ought to be wind at their back and that creates pressure on Congress to do more. One of the um, points of friction between nutrition advocates and anti-hunger advocates uh, has to do with SNAP and soft drinks, where some people would like to see soft drinks uh, not covered by SNAP. Uh, how do you feel about that? Is it time for pilot projects? Look, you know, one of the things we do know that works is incentives. Uh, you know, in Massachusetts, we have this program called the Healthy um, uh, the, 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 the HIP program, the Healthy uh, Incentives Program, that, that basically you get double your SNAP dollar if you buy fresh fruits and vegetables at a farmer's market. It is wildly successful. Um, you know, the clients love it because they have access to uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. The farmers mm -hmm. love it because it helps them as well. You know, and we so we know that if we provide incentives, that people will make better choices. I prefer that, quite frankly, to a system where we're saying you're poor, and so we're going to tell you you can't buy this, you can't buy this, you can't buy this. By the way, our nutrition challenges are not just a problem that people who are economically challenged face. Of course, everybody does, right? So, so let, let, we don't want to stigmatize people anymore. We don't want people, you know, we, we want to treat people like the way we want to be. We don't want to be treated the same way. So. I think incentives are a better way to change people's okay. behavior rather than you know, denying people the ability to make certain purchases. Thank you.
Uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Marian Nessel, who's one of the most widely quoted nutritionists in the country. And as you heard, the author of a new memoir, a terrific memoir called Slow Cooked. Um, Marian, what do you take away from the conference? Well, first of all, I loved being there. Um, and I loved being there um, not only because I was invited at the very last minute, but also because it was just wonderful to see all of the people there who I hadn't seen in three years, who were all interested in the same kinds of issues. I thought there were three things about the conference that were extraordinary, maybe even more than three. Uh, one was it was laser focused on hunger. Uh, there was a lot of talk about diet related chronic disease, but the absolute focus was on making sure that enough that everybody gets enough to eat. And, and that was really the focus of it. Um, I thought that was a strength and a weakness. It was an enormous strength because it kept the focus on what is the most acute pro food problem that we have in this country. Um, I suppose it's a weakness because the conference really wasn't about addressing diet related chronic disease in the entire population, a population in which three quarters of American adults are overweight or obese. Uh, that really didn't get discussed. Um, but the other things that I thought were terrific were the inclusion of people with lived experience of hunger. This is the first time I've seen that at a national conference. The woman who introduced the president of the United States was someone with lived experience of food stamps. The personal stories in every panel and in every session of people whose lives were changed for the better because of their participation in food assistance programs was extremely moving. And then of course, it was a love fest very deservedly for Jim McGovern, who was really responsible for all of this. And I, I thought that part of it was really terrific. What I missed was the uh, a greater focus on diet related chronic disease. As I said, it was really not a focus of this of this conference. A lot of lip service to it and a lot of talk about it. But doing something about diet related chronic disease would mean taking on the food industry. And that's not what this meeting was about. So it is fair to say that the recommendations did address chronic diseases to some extent. You know, a couple of things are the uh, uh, fruit and vegetable bonuses in the SNAP program, front of package labeling and sodium reductions, voluntary programs. But, you know, when you look at the soaring rates of diabetes, soaring rates of obesity, you know, it's just shocking. You see the numbers just go up, 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 up. Um, uh, somebody sent me a 1974 Washington Post article that said, so this is 1974, almost 50 years ago. Hunger has indeed been allevi alleviated, but nutrition has made no headway. That's from um, the, a Senate panel, the um, Nutrition and Human Needs Committee. Um, and many people think that that's the case today, that we just haven't made progress on nutrition. Why is it so hard? Can you explain some of the underlying uh, causes of that failure? Well, my view is that it, it involves taking on the food industry. It means stopping food industry production of unhealthy products. It means stopping food industry marketing of an unhealthful products to kids. Um, it means creating an agricultural system that is focused on public health rather than on feeding animals or fueling automobiles. It really means changing the food system in ways that go against big agriculture, big food, and a lot of the very powerful corporate interests in the food supply. And nobody wants to take that on because it's politically impossible. It's Let's ask uh, Representative McGovern about that. Do, <laughs> All right. do you feel pressure from the soft drink industry, the meat industry, uh, the cheese industry, and so on. You know, yeah, you know, look, I'm from Massachusetts. So I mean, uh, you know, we got cranberries. So, um, you know, but the but the, but the deal is, I mean, look, I mean, for me, I mean, it, it you know, I, I there's no doubt that people get on the agriculture committee, 
to defend the subsidy, uh, you know, of their state, whatever that may be. And it may be something that's not particularly healthy. We certainly need to move in a different direction. I mean, we need to improve our agricultural system in this country, uh, one that is not about agribusiness, uh, one that is about preserving our, our soil, preserving our environment, um, understanding what the impacts of climate change, and actually producing healthy food for everybody. We need a 50 state farm policy. Um, and we've gotten used to importing everything from halfway across the country and sometimes halfway around the world. But so, I mean, I, I, so, that, that, so that, that, is a, that is a challenge. But it's, the food industry is, is one of the challenges, but our medical industry is a, is a challenge too. Our medical industry is about treating you when you are sick and not very much focused on preventing you from getting sick. And by the way, even when you're sick, treating you with, you know, with the latest drug and not with food. Uh, and so we need, a, we need a change of attitude there. Our, our educational system is totally divorced from food and agriculture. I mean, I mean we, we, we have generations that don't know how to even cook how to prepare food. Um, that is part of promoting good nutrition and also stretching your dollar so you can actually afford more. So we, we, need, we, need, we need a whole, we need multiple systems to change uh, in, this, in this conversation. Uh, and again, I, you know, I, and, uh, you know, I think there were, you know, for those who think that we should have, that more time should have been spent on I'm discussing kind of diet related diseases and how we how we address them in that in that conference. There were some breakout sessions that did that. But I mean, today, again, one of the outgrowths of that conference was what the Secretary of Agriculture did. And he held this conference, uh, this summit uh, today on nutrition security and health care. Um, and, um, you know, and this is the first of many post summit conferences that will, will occur. So, look, we are talking about these things. Uh, and um, and I think that when we talk, when we get to the next farm bill, that much of what was prioritized at this conference will be discussed. Let's hope we can get some of it done. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I think some of the legislation that you're going to see uh, come before uh, you know uh, uh, Congress and some of the amendments you'll see to the farm bill will reflect a lot of the concerns that that Marion has just mentioned and others on this conversation will mention. Look, awareness is growing. Public opinion um, is changing. Uh, there's awareness there that wasn't always there. And I think people want, want better food, want healthier food, more nutritious food, not just for themselves, but for their kids. And, uh, and I think that's the direction we're moving in. And this conference, I think, was a big you know, gust of wind at the backs right. of those who want change. Okay, we'll count on you for, uh, in the next Farm Bill to incorporate all the recommendations. But let's uh, move on to Dariush Mozafarian. Uh, Dari is an, a distinguished nutrition researcher. He and I, I was privileged to co-author a couple of papers with him. And he's perhaps the strongest advocate in the academic world for improved nutrition policies. He's made Tufts really a leader, again, I should say. Uh, Dari? Well, so um, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, at first I agree with many of the comments that were made. I, I will highlight a, a few key points um, myself. So first that, you know, the conference itself, the day itself was really not that important. I mean, it was a nice day to bring people together. What was important was the national strategy. Mm -hmm. The national strategy was really what was important. And the White House was working on that for about 14 months. We, we had a conversation with the Domestic Policy Council in July of 2021, when they started working, working and thinking about these issues, and so and Congress, Congressman McGovern, and others in Congress have been thinking about these issues. So that the the day itself was a culmination and a presentation of the national strategy. So really, what's exciting and what's historic is the national strategy, and I think the national strategy is extremely ambitious um, and and has a lot of really exciting things in it. Um, the second point I would make is that there are things in the national strategy that the administration can do alone without new funding. Very, very important things, a lot of important things. And having the president uh, say that this is a priority for him, having Susan Rice and the Domestic Policy Council say, yes, I get it, this is a priority for me. Having secretaries Becerra and, and Bill Sack, you know, two of the, the most important cabinet secretaries say this is important as long, uh, together with secretaries of VA, DOD, education, transportation, housing and urban development, uh, all of these uh, small business administration, commerce, uh, Treasury, all of these agencies were represented in the plan, 
And the administration actions in the plan came from the agencies, came from the agencies themselves. They're saying, this is what we're gonna do. So that's what's most exciting. There are things in there for Congress to do, and there are things in there for the private sector to do, and, and those will you know, not be as straightforward as agency action. So I think it's a really terrific historic document. Even if 25% of it happens, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Um, now, what, what are the most exciting, some of the most exciting things in it? Um, so there's a lot in there about streamlining and modernizing access and participation in the federal nutrition programs. That's great. Whether it's school lunch or WIC or SNAP or Meals for the Elderly, there's a lot in there about making sure you can enroll, making sure you don't have barriers to stay on, making sure you can do online shopping, making sure you can think about and understand all, all of your benefits. So that, that's terrific. You know, number two, there's a lot in there about strengthening nutrition, particularly in school meals uh, and, and in WIC. Um, there's a little bit in SNAP, and, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. There's definitely some in SNAP. Um, I think there could have been a little bit more. The second exciting thing outside the federal nutrition programs is food as medicine. To me, that's the single most game-changing theme of, of the report because it's saying that healthcare, which is 30% almost of the federal budget, almost 20% of our entire economy, $46,000 a year for the average family of four should be spent on healthy food. That's a game changer. W Willie Sutton, the bank robber, was asked why he went to banks and robbed banks. He said, that's where the money is. Can you you got to go to healthcare. Uh, let me interrupt. Can you yeah. explain to, the, to, to us what, what food is medicine? What does it mean? Yeah, well, so I, I mean, it could, it could have lots of meanings, but I use food as medicine to mean, you know, integrating food and nutrition into healthcare. So when you go to your doc doctor, your doctor understands nutrition. They assess you for nutrition. And if you need healthy food, they write a prescription and your healthcare pays for your healthy food. It's happening. It's happening in Massachusetts. It's happening in Oregon, happening in California, happening in North Carolina, um, happening at the federal level with the produce prescription program, happening in the private sector. Uh, five years ago, Tufts had zero grants on food as medicine. Today, we have 11 grants on food as medicine. We just got a $6.3 million grant from NIH, uh, Christina Economos, going into the Mississippi Delta, working with black farmers to help them grow specialty crops, buying those specialty crops and giving it to low-income patients in Mississippi with diabetes and prediabetes and measuring the effects on their, on their health, health uh, endpoints. So, so food as medicine, I think, Mike, is the second really terrific innovation. I think the third uh, innovation is advancing nutrition science. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. There's a lot of things we have to learn about the microbiome, child development, brain health, personalization, timing of meals, supplements, I mean, additives, the list goes on. And so, so having a pillar and a focus on nutrition science, I think is important. And the last thing that is in the report, um, but isn't kind of in one section, you kind of have to find it. There's a lot in there on advancing business innovation. So there is a lot in there about the private sector. It's mostly carrots, it's not sticks, but there's a lot in there, a lot of carrots for the private sector to shift toward equitable food that addresses food security and nutrition security. And then just to, to, to finish, there's a few things that I think could have been in there that aren't. I'm 95% I'm delighted. You know, I don't want to be a nit nitpick, but you, you asked what was, you know, in your question, what, what would I have liked to see? I would have liked to see, see a little bit more focus on SNAP pilots, on letting USDA asking states to innovate on ways to address food and nutrition security and SNAP and try different innovative approaches. That's one thing I would have liked to see. I would have liked to see more attention on, on structure and authority around nutrition science, in particular a National Institute of Nutrition at NIH. And lastly, I would have liked to see something, some structure and authority to coordinate all of this because you know we want this to outlast the Biden administration. We want this to outlast 2030. And there's, there's nothing in the national plan about actually coordinating creating some structure authority like a national office of food and nutrition to coordinate this into the future. And in that 1974 article that you mentioned, uh, Mike, Senate hearing, that was the number one message from the panel that, that there was no ownership of food and nutrition in the federal government and there's a need for a new office. That was their conclusion from 1974. But those are small, small minor you know, wishes, dream wishes of a, of a, a Boston cardiologist. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with all the rest of the report. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. Uh, the report mentions that the FDA is going to is moving ahead, looking at front of package labels. And when some of us think of front of package labels, we think of the labels 
that are being used in Chile, Mexico, Israel, Uruguay, soon Canada, that have little uh, warning icons for uh, foods that are high in added sugar, saturated fat, sodium, and, and um, uh, calories. Do you think that kind of labeling would have an impact on what the public's eating? So I think front to pack labeling mostly has an impact on industry because industry doesn't ever want to have a red light or a negative thing mm -hmm. on their thing. It has a small effect on consumers. We've done analyses showing it does affect consumer behavior, but it's bigger impact does on industry behavior. So I think front to pack labeling could have a positive impact if the focus is correct. And, and we've learned over the last 30 years that kind of reductionist nutrition science focusing on single nutrients, particularly nutrients that are naturally in foods is unhelpful. So I think a, a front to back label focused on, on salt would be okay. I think it'd be better if it was focused on, on the ratio of sodium to potassium. I don't think a front to back label focused on added sugar or saturated fat would be useful. In fact, I think it would be harmful and drive companies to make wrong decision and drive consumers to make wrong decisions. You just can't judge the healthfulness of a food from a handful of nutrients. So if there's going to be a front to pack label, Mike, um, which the FDA is considering, what I'd love for them to do is to do it based on a holistic nutrient profiling system that emphasizes food ingredients in particular and processing. Uh, and then of course, also a little bit on some additives like salt and sugar. But if it's just salt and sugar on the front to pack, we're going to still have a really bad diet at the end of the day. That's just a little bit lower in salt and sugar. And, okay. and so, and, and so I think we need to have a more holistic uh, vision like the new FDA definition of healthy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I should note, um, well, no, I won't note <laughs> just to keep things moving. Uh, our next speaker is Kirsten Toby. Uh, she's a co-founder of Revolution Foods and you're at a place where the rubber meets the road or the vegetables meet the kids. Um, Revolution Foods serves foods in thousands of, of schools as well as senior centers. Uh, so what did you think of the conference? Yeah, well, thank you for having no, me I on this. I shouldn't say the conference, the recommendations. Yes, I, I, I completely agree that it was less about the day and more about the, the sort of bringing together of the voices and, and the creation of the national strategy. Um, and, you know, like others have said, I think it's it's going to be incredibly important to see kind of what comes next, right? And and how does this all how does this all kind of all these ideas how do they actually come into reality? Because um, I am really focused on kind of where the where the food meets the mouth, so to speak. And um, so, but I think you know generally, I think the the federal leadership on this is incredibly important and and wonderful to see. I think you know bringing together so many different agencies. Um, you know, it's sort of double edged. It's it's incredible to see it, but I tend to agree with uh, with Dr. Musafarian that you know, if only we had a single agency that was focused on on you know nutrition and food that could um, that could take a, a more unified approach. You know, certainly would make life easier for the folks at the uh, you know the sort of end users, um, so to speak. Whether it's a school food service director, whether it's an individual family trying to access their their SNAP dollars. Um, I do. I also, you know, really appreciate that that school meals were, you know, front and center. I think it's such a huge lever that we, as a country, can continue to focus on for um, both food security and nutrition. I mean, I think there's, you know, a lot of great research on on the power of school meals for both. I'm, you know, I'm I'm also on the the uh, this this sort of side of things that thinks, you know. We should we should go back to universal meals. We did it during the pandemic and um, saw the impact that it can have. We now see the impact that it's having in California and you know a couple of other states, Maine, and um, it's. I think it's you know it's clear that we can do it and that it's you know that with with the political will, it's it's possible to make food available to every single kid in school and to kind of reduce all those barriers, especially for the families that that live on the, that live on the edge and are kind of going, you know, mm -hmm. in and out of the poverty line, um, or the, the qualification line for, um, for, for federally subsidized meals. Um, so, you know, I, I sort of love the focus on, on school meals, but think that there's, you know, more that can be done there. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see how the healthy meals incentive program will play out, what that will look like, you know, how, how I, I think incentives can be a powerful force, um, but you know, also want to see what can be learned from that to 
to generate more kind of broad sweeping policy. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to sort of in some of the, in terms of some of the bigger ideas, I do agree. I think food is medicine and, and starting to change the, the national conversation around food being a critical part of our healthcare system is important. I think there's a lot of, there's still a lot to work out in the sort of logistics of what that looks like and, and how do, how do you actually get sort of, you know, prevent it, the, the preventive medicine into the houses and the, and the, you know, onto the tables of the people who need it most. Mm -hmm. We've done just a little bit of work in that space and, you know, things like home delivery are incredibly difficult and, and expensive to, um, to execute, but it's also hard to get the people who need the food most to come to places where they can access the, the meals that will, you know, that will serve as their, their medicine. So I think that there's, there is, you know, still a lot of, of kind of innovation that needs to happen to make that, you know, that dream kind of a reality. Um, what is the, uh, is your industry, the companies that produce school foods, the, the um, workers in the schools, are they doing as much as they could be to push this, these programs, uh, either as regulations, guidances, legislation? Are they doing as much as they could be or what more should they be doing? Well, if we're talking about this, the school nutrition program specifically, I mean, I think, well, I think there is certainly more that could be done to, you know, I think increasing participation rates is what we're talking about. You know, how do you increase participation rates in breakfast programs? How do you increase participation rates in after school supper programs? Because those are the two sort of lowest participation programs that there are. Um, there's a lot of great work going on in schools to bring breakfast after the bell and, you know, grab and go breakfast options mm -hmm. into, um, in directly into classrooms. Um, you know, those, uh, there's been a lot of good research on that too, that, you know, once you, if you kind of open up the possibility of eating after the school bell has, has begun or after the school bell has, has rung at the end of the day for the, for after school meals, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot that can be done. I think there is still more that can be done at the policy level, particularly on after school meals. I mean, one of the things that we saw during the pandemic was that when, when schools were allowed to send after school suppers home to kids, um, who were, you know, not in, not enrolled in after school programs, you had much higher participation rates in, um, in after school meals and, and had a, you know, a, a major impact on food security for those kids who didn't necessarily have a, a dinner on the uh -huh. table. Um, so that's no, the kind I of thing. I want to ask specifically, uh, are you, is, is the industry, broadly speaking, doing enough to push Congress to pass some of the legislation, get USDA and FDA to adopt regulations? That's a great question. I mean, I'm not heavily involved in lobbying efforts and I don't know, um, you know, I, I know that there are industry associations that are, that are doing, you know, that are, that are lobbying. I don't know that the industry associations are necessarily, you know, always focused on what's best for kids and nutrition. I think, you know, in many, many cases, they're focused more on, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna drive the bottom line of, of the industries that are doing that, um, doing that pushing. So, I think, I mean, and, and this is my personal opinion, I think that that we need to see more, um, you know, more focus, whether it's from the industry side, from the private sector, or from the public sector on kind of what's what's going to be best for the kids, the families, um, uh -huh. and the, the administrators of programs to be able to, to, you know, deliver the programs that need to be delivered. So, you know, mm -hmm. just a very simple example for a school leader, you know, they're having well, to manage... Hold oh. the thought for a moment. I saw the congressman nodding his head when you were making some of those those comments. And what kind of interact? How helpful has the um, school food association and food service industry been in getting legislation adopted or blocked? I oh, also see a big smile from Marion, and I bet she'd like to chime yeah. in on this. <laughs> well, Congressman, your, your mic is turned off. You're... Well, let me let, let me go to Marion because she'll make more sense than I do. So <laughs> and then I'll follow her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll see about that. The little mute button in the lower left, Marion. Well, Congressman, why don't why don't you go ahead while Marion 
figures out the microphone. Okay, got it. Got <laughs> it. I, I don't know what that was about. Uh, the school food, the school food nutrition um, association is that what it's called? The school nutrition association is the lo lo the lobbying organization for uh, school food service workers and you would think that it would be the organization that's at the forefront of fighting for universal school meals, uh, better food in schools, more money for school nutrition. I mean, all of the things that school food advocates have been arguing for for decades. Um, they get about half their money from food companies that make products for schools, and they're put in a very awkward conflict of interest sometimes, um, so that they're not, in fact, the leading organization uh, to be advocating for school meals. But I want to make a comment about school meals, because the, the rules for school meals are extremely important, but carrying them out at the local level is extraordinarily school dependent. And in my experience, there are two skills. Uh, this doesn't apply to Revolution Foods because they've got the food in the package. But for schools that are making food and delivering food, um, uh, there are two skills, making good food and getting the kids to eat it. And these are two completely separate skills in schools in which there are adults who care what the kids are eating. They make sure that the food is good enough and that the kids are eating it because they connect with the kids in an extremely personal way. And it's very hard to understand this from a policy level, but going around from school to school, uh, Revolution Foods can make the best packages in the world, but if the kids are aren't eating it, it doesn't do any good. And, th and that requires adults in the school, or I don't know if your company is involved in this, but getting the kids to understand how important food is, how much fun it is, how experimental it is. Um, I'm all for school gardens and cooking programs and every school we can get them in, because those really make a difference. Yeah, and, if I, and let me just say, um, look, I. Congress isn't being pressured enough to to do the right thing. Uh, number one, we 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 quite frankly uh, could use a little bit more outside pressure to like uh, make sure that the reimbursement for schools school meals is higher, so that school districts have you know uh, some choice into uh, into the type of food that they provide uh, the their young people. The other thing is that um, we 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 also need to understand that as we call for higher nutritional standards, which I'm all for, we gotta make sure the food tastes good. Um, and you know, kids won't eat food that they don't like. Just like if you're in the hospital, you won't eat food that's good for you, but it doesn't, it tastes like cardboard, right? So we, we have to be creative in terms of how we present food and how we prepare food. Uh, we have a lot of schools that don't have infrastructure to be able to prepare meals on site, uh, to, be even, to even be able to store fresh fruits and vegetables. Everything has to be brought in. And the other thing is, I think, to the extent that we can integrate nutrition in our curriculum, I, I don't, I don't even, you don't need a separate course, but just so kids begin to understand the, the nutritious value of certain foods, that will help. Um, you know, I, 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 you know I, I've found when I visit school cafeterias that those cafeterias that you know, have options and they are able to tell young people you know, the nutritional value of this versus that, kids tend to make the right choices uh, on that. You know, I was at a, at, a, at a public school in Washington, D.C. the day before the conference um, in a very economically challenged neighborhood. And, you know, one of the challenges there is not just getting people fresh fruits and vegetables, it's families are not used to the fresh vegetables that, were, that are being given to them. Um, but in the schools, you know, they're introducing uh, some of these uh, uh, fresh vegetables. And they're doing it in a way, I, the day I was there, they were introducing squash. Most of these kids at this particular school, you know, their, their families don't prepare squash for them. This day, DC Central Kitchen was part of this collaboration. You know, they, as kids were changing classes, they had three different types of squash and the kids got to taste them. And the one they liked best, they voted for. And that was on the school menu the next week. Well, that not only helps kids appreciate the value of vegetables, but it also Kids are teachers, they go home and they tell their parents, we want this. Uh, and so, you know, it, this, this, we have to connect the dots here, right? It's not just one thing. And so Congress's role in this ought to be, we ought to provide adequate reimbursement 
so that local communities can make, you know, the appropriate choices, and including, you know, culturally appropriate food, depending on, you know, where the school happens to be. Uh, so, um, so I, I think there's, there's lots of room for creativity and growth and getting this right. And my hope is that one of the things that comes out of this conference are conversations that will get us uh, to that point. I, um, I'd like to just, um, in a few minutes, we're going to open it up for public questions, but I'd like to ask a question, especially to uh, Dr. Mazafarian, because I listened last night to um, a, a speech that he gave last week on it. One of my concerns, and I don't know if anybody else shares this, is that food is such a big issue. Even putting it under one place in the government doesn't solve the fact that food is a big issue. How do we walk and chew gum with all of these different issues, whether it's school food or food as medicine or um, training of physicians and all the different issues we have and actually get something to, to happen to create momentum that moves forward and gets our communities to move forward? Tee us up a little bit on that. Yeah. Well, so I think having a first an overarching coordinating office doesn't mean you put the budget and the staff and all the programs in that office. I mean, all the all the agencies, all the administrations purpose to stay the same, but you have a coordinator. And the analogy for that is after September 11th, Congress did a hearing, uh, not a hearing, did an investigation and recognized that, you know, we, we could have missed some intelligence because the FBI wasn't coordinating with the CIA, wasn't coordinating with the National Security uh, Agency. And so they created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in 2003 to coordinate national intelligence. And that office has been extremely successful. The Director of National Intelligence sits in the cabinet, sits on the National Security Council, meets regularly, I think maybe meets every day with the president um, and has been an extraordinarily successful office. The threat of food to, to our country is bigger than the threat of bombs and tanks, right? More 600,000 Americans dying a year, incredible cost to our economy. Uh, and so we need a similar office and a leadership, you know, in the White House, talking to the president, advising the president, guiding the programs. So it's a, it's a, it, the problem is food is everywhere. Nutrition is everywhere. It touches all aspects of our life, including culture and fun and family and sports and everything else. And so there is no single silver bullet. And so we really need to do a suite of programs. I think that, you know, if, if there are 30 or 40, there's not 6,000, there's 30 or 40 major actions, major things that could really move the needle on hunger, nutrition, and health. You know, and, and so it's not one, but it's also not 300. So I think if we can find, even if we can do four or five of those 30 things, you know, generations beyond us will thank us. If we can do 10 or 20, Right, we're gonna we're gonna be incredibly happy, and our kids are gonna be incredibly happy and healthier. Um, we have ten minutes left, and I see there are a couple of questions, but I wonder if any of the panelists would want to talk to another panelist and uh, question, comment, scold. I don't know. Yeah, I have a, a question that I, I'm sort of curious about is who is going to hold the country accountable for these very, the various recommendations? Um, you know, one problem with the national strategy is that it had recommendations that cover absolutely everything. Um, I wanted to see some very clear priorities and some measurable outcomes. Uh, but who is going to hold it accountable in the absence of an office that does that kind of thing? Is this something that we're going to leave up to the public? As Jim McGovern suggested, that this is a public thing and that we're expecting the public community to take charge of this without somebody leading it and without somebody in charge? It worries me. Yeah, well, let me just say, I'm not, ad, I'm not at, at all opposed to having a point person or an office that oversees the implementation of all of this, but let's not kid ourselves. Uh, you know, you can, you can have an office to implement this, but uh, you can have an administration that is not sympathetic and you can have somebody very bad in that office that could do a lot to un undercut all of what we're trying to get done here. So yeah, we ought to, we ought, there ought to be somebody, there ought to be somebody who every day gets up and you know says hunger and nutrition and security okay what are you doing what are you doing what are you doing i mean we ought to have that and there ought to be a point person you know uh, right now susan rice is kind of taking the lead on this which i think is uh, an important signal that this administration is taking this seriously 
but in the long term, there ought to be somebody. We ought to figure that out. Um, and, um, and I think that hopefully we will get to that. The other thing is we do have to keep them accountable. All of us who are at this conference who have been advocates on this now have something to point to and say, you promised this. You know, when is it going to get done? Where are you on this? Um, and there will be follow-up meetings. There'll be multiple follow-up meetings and, and gatherings, and we will have the opportunity to get up and say, where are you on this? And I think the fact that, you know, again, USDA held a, another meeting today is an indication that they're serious about this stuff. I mean, you know, some of us were worried we would do a conference and it, and it would be absent a national strategy. They have a national strategy. That's good. Then our next worry was they'll have a national strategy and then we'll never hear from anybody again. That has not been the case. Um, and so I'm giving the, the, the Biden-Harris administration the benefit of the doubt that they are serious about this. I had a good conversation with Secretary Vilsack today. He is really committed to this stuff. Secretary Becerra, I talked to him on my way out of the meeting today. He is very committed to this stuff, but it's up to us to, in a very nice and constructive and friendly way, like we always do, uh, remind them that they made promises and we expect them to keep those promises. If not, we are going to call you out. Um, it's that simple. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, let's push for that coordinator, that point person, that office that will be there. Uh, but let's also understand understand that we have a responsibility to really keep the pressure on. And can I just answer that too, Mike? Mike, can I can I come comment too here? Sure. So I just want to echo and and highlight everything uh, that uh, Congressman McGovern said. And so right now you have the President Susan Rice, the Secretary of Agriculture, and the Secretary of HHS all committed. That's incredible, right? That's incredible. So that's an incredible group. You also have several congressmen and uh, and and women and several senators who are really committed to at least aspects of the plan. That's incredible. Uh, and not a lot will happen unless the public and the private sector and the advocacy sector keep up the pressure and really talk to these folks because they have other priorities too. There's the war in Ukraine, there's energy issues, there's pollution, there's going to be another virus someday, right? There's all kinds of other things. And so while they're all committed to it, it really is up to the people on this call um, to really keep up the pressure. And, and beyond the people in the federal government, we have to keep keep up the attention to governors. We have to keep up the attention to mayors. We have to keep up the attention to CEOs of healthcare organizations and food sector companies and, and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have to keep up the pressure to you know the heads of foundations and how they invest their dollars and, and money. Food is the single biggest problem facing the country that we can actually fix in the next 10 years. Uh, and so and so I think we're at a we all kind of knew this. Marion knew this. Mike, you know this. This is why you created CSBI. This is why we've done the work we've done. We have kind of a historic moment and a coming together where we could actually have a tipping point and really start to see things move in the right direction. But to get to the, the issue of oversight, um, in the 1970s, the Senate Select Committee on Hunger and Human Needs, or Hunger, Nutrition, and Human Needs, with Do Senators Dole and McGovern, was extremely effective. They held, I don't know, dozens of hearings on, on hunger and nutrition. It seems like that sort of thing is an entity that could keep the pressure on the successive administrations. Is there any chance of getting such a committee on the House or the Senate? Oh, I, I would love to see that a, a committee like that. Um, it, it's a challenge to create another committee. That's why I, I turned the rules committee, which I chair into basically the, a, a, a semi-select committee on nutrition and human needs. And we've done dozens of hearings and we've done dozens of site visits all across the country leading up to this conference. Uh, but you know, the agriculture committee has a responsibility to do oversight hearing. The education and labor committee does, the energy and commerce committee does. And that's gonna, and whether they do that will depend on who's chairing those committees. Uh, and whether or not they care about the, these issues. Look, here's, here's kind of the, the bad news. The bad news has been some of these issues we're talking about have been politicized and have become partisan issues over the years. The good news is that we're starting to reach out and get more bipartisan support on some of these initiatives. This conference, um, you know, we've been requesting it forever, but we did a formal request. Myself, a Democrat from Massachusetts, Cory Booker, a Democrat from New Jersey, Jackie Walorski, unfortunately, she, we lost her to a tragic car accident, uh, but a Republican from Indiana and Senator Braun, a Republican senator from Indiana, all joined together 
in requesting this. Uh, Senator Bill Frist, Republican from Tennessee, was at the conference, was on a panel. Um, and what I'm finding is that there, at least at the state legislative uh, level, lots of Republican state reps and senators, some Republican mayors are expressing an interest in this. So we need to continue to try to build that McGovern Dole, you know, if you will, bipartisanship on this. It is hard because let's be honest, you know, uh, the, the challenges that face a lot of poor people in this country, you know, have been politicized. Uh, people who are living in poverty have been demonized. Uh, their struggle has been diminished. It has been grotesque what I have seen happen over the last 20 years here. Uh, we, need to, we, we need to try to figure out a way to fix that. And if not, we got to beat them. I mean, it's that simple. We just have to be persistent and we have to win because, I mean, this above all is a moral issue. Um, and I have seen too many hungry people in Massachusetts and around the country. If you see a hungry child, it breaks your heart. If it doesn't, you are not human. Uh, senior citizens who are in emergency rooms because they've taken their medication on an empty stomach. I mean, it is unacceptable. The richest country in the history of the world. And we've got you know close to 40 million people who don't know where the next meal is going to come from. If we can afford to you know, spend gazillions on bombs and nuclear weapons, we ought to be able to afford what is necessary to solve this problem and also to deal with this other issue of diet related diseases. We can do this. Uh, and, um, and I think outside of Washington, there's a lot more bipartisan support. We just have to build on it. Okay, let's hope so. Guys, um, yeah, um, we are almost at time. And obviously we, uh, we have too good a panel <laughs> and we have too much, we have wonderful amount of passion and not enough time for our, um, our audience Q&A, but I, I do this again, and maybe we will if everybody permits, because it is important to me and I think to everybody else who is listening, as I know it is to the other panelists, that this isn't just a report that sort of lands with a thunk, that there continue to be meetings. One comment that I had is in the lead up to this, I knew many people who wanted to get involved and to be helpful and to be part of it, and they didn't find a way in. So I ask you, Congressman McGovern, um, help us find a way to be uh, to be involved because there is um, a wider group of organizations and people and passion all around the country who feel as you all do that food is food is existential for everyone um, in all ways. Um, Let me thank. Uh, we've we've run into the uh, four o'clock Eastern time limit, and I think we should end with an apology. To the people who submitted questions and uh, sure. yeah. I hate that when that happens to me but uh, sorry we have to do it and with also end with a note of real gratitude for each of the speakers to take some time out of their busy schedules and spend an hour with us. Thank you. And, and thank you to each of you, to the congressman, to Marion, her new book is wonderful, to Dr. Mazafarian, who is just exceptional, and to Kristen Toby, whom I admire for many of these years. Um, thank you, we will follow up. Thank you. And thank you to Heritage Radio Network and to Foodscribe. There was a lot of effort that went into making this happen, and I, I'm just thrilled, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mike. Bye. All right, we're good. Bye-bye. <laughs>